So yeah, go ahead and get started here. Just trying to continue, and Gene, great, great presentation. Just to conclude, uh, to continue off of momentum he built, uh, I'm just going to give a brief overview. I'm not sure I'll need the full 20 minutes, but feel free to ask questions um, as they go along, or, or if you're holding them till the end, I'm happy to answer them at the end. Um, so I'm going to briefly describe the screen software, uh, which, which I have to say before I get started here. Obviously, this is a joint uh, collaborative effort with. Uh, Signature Science, of course, uh, Krista and Jean and, and many others. And also have to make sure to shout out uh, Invite, who's the primary developer of the software in the previous, or uh, you know, Bryce Kill, who was in my group previously. So, so huge team effort over many years and excited to kind of share some high level details with you all. And I also want to say this is, this is really meant to be uh, a community facing software. And there's, I think there's a lot of space in this area and have been excited to partner with Kevin from Acklid and see all the great things he's doing. So I really, please take today's conversation more as a general overview and framework that I think is, is, is a great place for community feedback and input and collaboration rather than me saying that this is the one way and only way to do this. I, I do not feel that way. I don't think any of us feel this way. It's, it's really about, I think this is a, a community effort. I think we need um, all hands on deck here. And it's exciting to see uh, innovative methods like the ones that Kevin's developing at Acklid come out as well. So I think these are all complementary, collaborative, and exciting to see where, where we go in terms of biosecurity. Um, this has already been mentioned a few times, so I won't, I won't belabor this point. Um, but this uh, the software uh, was was uh, born out of the fun GCAT program. Uh, an IRPA program post focused on functional genomic uh, and computational assessment of threats. Um, so I won't revisit that whole history. Just wanted to uh, shout out to, to IRPA for funding this work. Um, and I just high level, just kind of give you some overview of what this is capable of. We've been running through some test cases today. Obviously, there's um, you know the the wonderful resources that RISA pro provided provides a uh, place to run some you know some of these analyses, but uh, there's there's many different environments where you may want to run the software tool. Uh, for some larger data sets, you may you know obviously want a, a, a better equipped server, or in some cases you might want to be running things on a laptop. So this is where this slide is like not talking about where um, if we're running in uh, kind of our fast and sensitive mode, um, say you want to run it on many many sequences, or say you want to run it even on maybe a set of metagenomic uh, reads, which can be a very large data set. Um, you're obviously going to want, want a server, a well-equipped server, and, and maybe a computational cluster. And then we have this new mode. There's a preprint now available uh, that describes Seek Screen ONT mode, uh, Seek Screen Nano, uh, again, uh, collaboration with Signature Science, of course, and then Ed Byte, who was the first author on this. Um, this is where we took some of the uh, ideas and, and optimized them and, and tailored them to the Oxford sequence, uh, Nanopore sequencing platform. Um, and it, this can run on a laptop. So, so again, there's different modes you can run the software in. It's meant to be configurable. Um, there's uh, obviously different ways you may want to run this, but for today's purposes, obviously we'd be, we're, we're tuning it so that it runs on the, the nodes that are provided to all of you. But uh, needless to say, the use cases are, are beyond those that, that you're running to today. And then the other comment I'll say is obviously uh, we depend on a database. The database actually, Gene set me up well. He described kind of how that was created. Uh, and that, that's really a, a key part of all of this. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this in, in, in additional slides here. But one really kind of key innovation of this software with all of these new and exciting machine learning techniques coming up, out now, specific to protein folding, structure, function prediction. Uh, what we really spent lots of time on was a human in the loop informed machine learning process where we had uh, experts, uh, bio curators and expertise that, that Gene provides and, and the, the team provided to set the foundation for the machine learning. And, and that, that, that was important. And, and, and I can get into some of the technical details, which I, I just don't have the time to do this, but I'm happy to follow up on that. But really when it comes down to, we have a limited set of training data and it can be noisy labeled. It really, you really do need to help uh, seed the process with uh, accurate labels at the beginning and, and, and an accurate training data set that you can then iterate on and improve. And that's really what this database is. And of course, we have the Seek Screen software in the, in the middle, which we'll talk about, which is this open source machine learning based uh, functional annotation software. 
And then we have S2FAST, which is the government purpose threat detection software, which Signature Science maintains. And they can go back to Krista if she wants to share any additional details there, but that's kind of where the all of this stuff fits in. If you're wondering, if you've heard some of these terms thrown around, this is kind of high-level overview. Um, so, so yeah, the, the paper for Screen was published last year in Genome Biology. Uh, so we, we have additional details there. Uh, as you can see by the, the number of co-authors, this is a very large collaborative effort um, and unique in the sense that I would say uh, every author, kind of irrespective of the order on this paper, made significant contributions to the software. So um, I just want to highlight that. Um, it's thankful to, for all of the team's contributions for all the different aspects because this is a very, in a highly multidisciplinary project carried out for over you know four or five years. Um, and in, without any one of these uh, individuals on this paper, this, this method would not exist. So, and then as what's been highlighted here is that we're doing, uh, it's, 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 it's available on, on GitLab. And so this is under my lab, uh, 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 GitLab site where I have a lot of open source software. And then one of the uh, is the screen here. Let me try to minimize this thing. I'm not sure if it's blocking the screen at all. Um, cool. And then, and then just high level. Uh, so I see some uh, questions in the chat, Krista. Feel free to. I, I'm not reading those, but if anyone wants to read those off to me or interrupt, feel free. This is again pretty informal discussion. Um, so screen just I think uh, is easy to install by a Conda, uh, if not if, or or Mamba. But if, if you're not familiar with that, we also provide Docker and Singularity containers, especially if you're an air gap system. But we feel the install pro process, thanks to feedback through government partners while we were performing on the contract, really helped us streamline the installation process. But but if you do run into any difficulty when installing, if you're interested in installing in your home environment, just reach out to any one of us. Uh, and we're happy to you can post an issue on the GitLab site that I shared, or feel free to reach out over email. We're happy to help work through your issue, any issues you might have. Uh, importantly, there's a check install option that allows, uh, that kind of makes sure that the install was correct. It's uh, it's not just a MD5 sum where it says, oh, did all the files copy over correctly? It actually looks and says, are every is everything where it should be, et cetera. And so you, so you do that after you do your install, and if that checks out, you're ready to go. And then I would also say that we do have a, a reasonably rich set of, of, of documentation on the wiki page. Uh, I say reasonably because obviously there's always just so many different ways you can run the software, but I do feel that we have put a lot of attention and detail into the documentation. But obviously, if you find anything that is unclear, either through today's workshop or when you're running the software, if you decide to run it, um, feel free to reach out again and say, please provide more detail or um, this is unclear, et cetera. And always keep in mind, you have the, the paper uh, as well, which, which can serve as a complement to, to the information on the wiki page. And then just if you have a question, there's three, you know, which mode should I use? Uh, this is a common question. If you just back up high level and say, just generally speaking in bioinformatics, you're gonna be faced with this question. So forgetting about seek screen for the moment, you're, you're often faced with questions, okay, um, do I need a fast answer? Uh, do I need a sensitive one? Or is there, and then the last one is, do I need to tailor my, my tool to a specific type of data, right? And that's what the third one is. But so the, for, the, for the fast answer, so certainly there are tools that can give fa fast and sensitive answers, but usually it's a trade-off. Usually you're sacrificing with speed, you're sac sacrificing sensitivity with almost every approach that, that exists nowadays for really any application. If you are um, going faster, usually you're trading up sensitivity, but not, but not always. Sometimes there's some really clever algorithms that allow you to get a lot faster and maintain the exact same sensitivity. But typically speaking, you need to think about when you're running through your analyses, um, how much time would you like to invest in the, the computation? And um, you, you need to ensure that you get all of the potential answers, if there are any in terms of the hits, or are you okay with maybe missing some of those with a greatly increased runtime? That's what fast mode is. It's the default mode. We set it that. Excuse me. We set it as default because it's a good choice for large data sets. It uses Diamond. Diamond's a wonderful uh, tool. If you're not aware uh, of it, uh, it, it you should check it out. We, we cite it, um, obviously, and it helps us accelerate our Blast X searches. Wonder, it's a very nice tool. Um, and then fast mode, importantly, only really uh, it only expects one protein coding region per read. So if you have very, very long reads and you try to run fast mode, you're not going to get a good result. Or you'll just get one coding region annotated per read, which you 
you probably don't want. So that's what, why the ONT mode was created. So if that's clear, I'll move on to sensitive mode. So sensitive mode is really where you think, okay, well, I need to, uh, see screen's unique. It wasn't, um, so it will kind of carefully characterize and annotate read by read. So you can imagine if your data set involves tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, tens of millions, et cetera, to a point that it, this, this will take very a long time. This is not how standard when you, when you kind of think about this, um, and most bioinformatics, you would you would you would not do a read by read analysis. But for the the design of Seek Screen, this is kind of a key aspect of how it operates. Is we really want to look at each read individually and characterize them separately, not combine them beforehand either by assembly or binning or whatever. We really want to look at each read independently. We each we have some reasons for doing that, um, uh, but but mostly it's for sensitivity and also thinking about. Uh, use cases which are most common, which are you know DNA screening, where you have to look at every single read, or in the case of let's say a metagenomic run, you you don't want to make any assumptions about the importance of something in the sample based on the abundance. There could be one read or two reads or three reads in your sample that are, that you really need to be able to characterize, and you can't skip over them. So that's kind of a high level, non technical reason for that. But I'm happy to have a sidebar conversation with anyone about those, that more detail, and then. And then for ONT mode, this is what you're running today. Uh, if you're memory limited, uh, it might spend a lot of time in optimizing this such that it can run in memory constrained environments. So they could run on laptops or, 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 or you know, workstations that have 32 gigs of byte around, or, around that. Um, and it, it allows for analysis of sequences that have more than protein, one protein coding region. It can have two, three, and, and it will uh, look at all of them. Okay. So, if that's clear, I'll pause here if there's any questions, but the, you know, this is kind of the key part here, particularly for if anyone's interested in running the tool afterwards. Uh, if you understand these three different modes, uh, you're, you're in good shape. Um, but I'll pause here for if there's any questions. Or comments. Okay, I'll keep going. I see some chat, but I'm not allowed to keep on the presentation. Um, the chat is, I've been posting um, links to the pubs and the GitLab and such. Okay. So oh, this, this is Beth. Yeah. So, so there, those aren't yeah, questions thank, coming in. <laughs> yep. Thank, thank you, Beth. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you for clarifying. I just don't have it open because I, I, I didn't want to, because uh, I, I, I spend too much time on, you know, chat. I'd probably get distracted and start having an interactive conversation with everyone. Um, and then all modes are in with Nextflow. For those who are not familiar with Nextflow, it's a workflow management system. Um, ba basically, in bioinformatics, there's, kind of, there's two, or most, probably three things that people do. They use Snakemake, they use Nextflow, or they just uh, use uh, their own Python script to do that. Uh, we, we like Nextflow. Snakemake is great as well. So it's really, you, you pick one or the others, kind of how, how you do this. Here's the preprint I mentioned previously. It's recently posted. This is really about the ONT mode that I just described. And really to enable infield characterization. Um, so it's something we want to um, uh, kind of just highlight here. It just more than anything, it's not meant to be kind of anything other than if you want more details on how this works, this is where you can go get them. And that's all I'm really highlighting that here for. Okay, so then parameters, uh, kind of the, the, the bane of all bioinformatics users and bioinformaticians. You, you download a tool, you have your data set, you get ready to run it. The paper says it's easy to run, you get good results, and then you said help, and you see all of these darn parameters, and you have no idea how to set them, what are reasonable thresholds, how much they influence your results, so you're stuck here. So I'm not going to fully solve that problem by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just here to say um, we've thought really hard about the problem for specific use cases to set reasonable defaults, and I highly encourage any users that want to deploy this to, to look carefully at each of these parameter settings and, and, and look at the defaults and see if they make sense to you. But the, we've, we've certainly validated them and thought a lot about setting the defaults, but that doesn't mean they're, they're, they're appropriate in all settings. One, for example, thread default is one, but obviously if you're in a multi-threaded environment, you know, multiple cores or et cetera, you want to crank that up, right? So for example, uh, for, and, and if, if you're uh, more of a, uh, Kind of funny power user here, you want to get into changing thresholds, you may want to change the e value th th threshold. So you may have a, a bit score e value threshold you want to change. Um, so, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to read through all of these, but needless to say, there's a lot of parameters. We have documentation on all these parameters. But if and when uh, you run this and you find that your questions are not 
answered or you're confused, this is a good point either to ping us uh, over over email or, or post an issue on the GitLab page. Okay, um, I've already hinted to this, so I don't think I really need to spend a ton of time here, but I'll just kind of go carefully through this just uh, very briefly, uh, just to highlight again and thank Gene for all the great work he's done on this, not only Gene, but you know many, many, many uh, scientists and folks at Signature Science and, and the team uh, writ large. Um, and and yeah, so we just kind of did this iterative machine learning process. Uh, the machine learning code is part of the 16 repository. And and so if anyone has any, if it, this this is just, a, I guess, a moment to briefly pause and kind of say, uh, I'm obviously part part of the inspiration for this module, uh, the, this process actually is, is thinking about this more from the community framework and how we would, um, I think, inspired by previous efforts that really engaged different communities to, to, to collectively look at problems like these and, and, and uh, discuss and, and it kind of do uh, crowd-based annotation. This, in this case, it's expert-based, of course, but you could see a system like this also being adapted to more of a crowd-based where we have many experts at many different places that would like to expand out and, and think about different types of problems like this in this, this framework that we built, I think really speaks to that. Um, and again, just as a shout out to previous efforts like this that, that have worked in, in, a, in a collaborative community-minded framework, which, which is what SeekScreen is. In terms of machine learning, I hate to always just throw up plots and hand wave. I'm gonna do that here. Um, it, it's the high level message is for this specific problem at the time when we, we were implementing the solution, uh, given the limited amount of training, even after that iterative process, we had to deploy an ensemble machine learning approach. And what is that? It means that no single machine learning approach that we tried really necessarily always would perform well based on characteristics of the data. So based on how you would train your data, you could get different, you would get different differing results based off of each, you know, either FunSock and the amount of training uh, data that we had for each one of those. So we, uh, Edvite uh, is the one who innovated this, but really had to come up with an ensemble strategy using different you know, both neural nets and support vector, uh, uh, et cetera, classifiers, and look at pros and cons of each of these approaches, carefully looking at the data for a very long time, and then deciding that we would combine these and and then, and then you know, execute a majority voting scheme. And, and that resulted in the best performance that we, we saw. And, and so the best performance is what we see here, but a jumble of lines, but let me just summarize it for you. Uh, very quickly, you don't have to stare at all the lines, but essentially what you want to look at is essentially the red line is the one, or not essentially, but it is the red line is the one that is the ensemble uh, call. Uh, the circles represent precision, and the X's will have the lines that X's will be recall. And, and then anything that's not red, it's going to be a, a classifier on its own. So what you see typically, that not, not always, but typically you'll see the red line is always above all the other colors. That means the ensemble is working. The other thing you want to note is that there are it's, there is variable performance across each of these uh, fun stocks that Gene has described. Um, so something you might want to note this is why I'm pausing here. So if you end up using the software and you happen to really care about a certain one of these uh, fun stocks here that are listed, you might want to note the performance uh, in that category. For example, uh, while bacterial counter signaling, you see there without the ensemble approach, we would be doing really poor, um, there are just some categories such as induced inflammation that just globally don't do as well as some of the other categories. And the, the summary for all of that, if I were to just summarize in one word, why is there variable performance, this all comes back to the amount of training data and the quality of training data we have in each of the fun socks. And that's probably the quickest and easiest way to describe that. So I'm hopeful with these new approaches and machine learning approaches that are coming out, uh, that there's ways of augmenting training data and improving this. But overall, the performance, I, I feel, is quite good. But obviously, there's always room for improvement. Um, another comment I want to make is, again, not pitching this to be the end-all, be-all for everything. For You see antibiotic resistance fun sock, while we see good performance in our hands, there's obviously a very, there's, there's uh, many, many tools that exist that, that do a great job with antibiotic resistance prediction. And you should, you can also run those, obviously, instead of relying on this information. It, this is more of the the view that there's a comprehensive view through Zeek screen, but it doesn't mean that for any specific one, specifically antibiotic resistance prediction, there, 
they're like the other tools or better tools that you could use on your data. And I just want to stop here by saying, you know, I want to thank um, my group, obviously Signature Science, I want to thank, and I think, you know, but, but specifically the group, Edvite and, and Yunchi for sure, the huge, huge efforts made not only for the software, but, but you know, the, the, the workshop today. So obviously I'm, I'm, I'm running around half the time, not really knowing where I'm going. So thanks to them for all this work that's getting done and, and really uh, seeing the vision that we had as a team executed and, and, and implemented. But obviously all this stuff is still work in progress in, in the sense that we can always improve. So all of your feedback is definitely welcome. If you end up using and enjoying the screen, I think the best, uh, the best uh, feedback I can get is just any your just honest feedback about anything you like or dislike about the software, so that we can keep in mind and prove it for the future. Uh, and with that, I, I think it's all I have here. Krista, I'll hand it back over to you and pause for questions. Great, thank you, Todd. Um, does anyone have any questions before we move on? All right. Well, you may have some questions about C-Screen as we jump in a little bit further. Um, 